I want to talk to you about demonstrating generosity. Demonstrating generosity has nothing to do and is far more reaching than generosity out of your pocketbook. Generosity is far more than what comes out of your bank account. Generosity is an attitude and a lifestyle. It's a lifestyle of being kind and good and courteous and peaceful and deferring yourself less in order for somebody else to be heard. And it's a challenge, but it's something that needs to be done. So I want to just believe God that today in this message, we're going to discover something in us that desires to demonstrate his generosity on a greater level. Amen. Amen. So let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, in the next few moments that we have together, I'm asking you to do something phenomenal. Plant in us a word, a seed that will grow to become marvelous. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. amen. All right. Now, how much time do I have? Because I see two different clocks up there. I just want to make sure that I'm, I'm in the right. All right. Let's turn to uh, Psalms chapter 78, please. Ch Psalms, excuse me, Chalms. <laughs> Psalms, <clears throat> Psalms 78, verse 38. I guess, man, that's just how the Holy Ghost is. He's like, okay, we're going to break the tension. Yeah. Dwayne, you're going to make yourself look silly. <laughs> that happens quite often, too. I'm going to tell you that. You know, over the last couple of days, we, we've had the opportunity, my, my wife and my family, we, we always try to get away with all of our girls and our grandbabies and uh, do a week of, of a getaway. And we're so honored that we still get to do that as a family. This year, we didn't get to do it as long because of different scheduling. So we broke away for two days and we got to go into uh, Mississippi and spend a little time there. And uh, the tragedy of the moment of where we all live at right now is that a lot of people are just, they're not experiencing what they once celebrated because of fear. Mm -hmm. So we went to a resort, what they consider a resort, and it was like, it was easy, easy to social distance. <laughs> there was nobody there. Um, in years past, when you go on vacation, you have to like leave your, your place of where you're staying for 4.30 to get to a restaurant to get there for five so that you can dine by seven. That's how busy it is. So we left 4.30, got there for five, and there was three cars in the parking lot. So needless to say, I mean, you're finished eating by 5.30. And I asked them, I said, where's everybody at? And they're like, we have no idea. And that's my concern, is where's everybody at? Verse 38, so we, I want you to know that, of course, we're talking about the Lord here. He, God, being full of compassion, forgave our iniquities. And I want you to notice something. Compassion never destroys. But I want you to, to, to know what compassion is. Compassion is mixed passion. Think about come passion. Compassion is a combination of both love and sorrow. That you're, you're drawn into a situation that's broken. People are hurting, but you're drawn in because you love them. And yet you have to learn how to sorrow with them. It's, it's, it's this moment that compassion changes enmity, like the enemy of my life, into a moment of at least temporary affection, where because of compassion, I moved from a place of separation and distance, but because of a mixture of both sorrow and love, I'm drawn in now into fellowship with you, even in whatever the condition may be for you or for me. How many of you have ever been in a situation before where you were in um, a tight situation? Perhaps you were sick or you know, a financial situation, a marital struggle of whatever, kids that, that are not going in the right direction. And somehow, some way, somebody that you may not have been in touch with for 30 years calls you out of the blue because... They either knew something was going on, but sensed that you needed a word 
of encouragement. You just needed something. That's compassion. It's like, I'm moved to you. And I'm touched by your sorrow, but I'm moved because of love. God, being full of compassion, forgives iniquities, but he doesn't destroy us. Yea, many a time he turned his anger away and he did not stir up all of his wrath. The whole point, though, is that God is full of compassion because he knows what truth is. He sees the brokenness and the sorrow and the struggle of mankind, but he's moved by love. Aren't you glad that God is compassionate? And I still have this, this moving on the inside of me that says this, that it's highly unlikely that your heart, which I want to call your heart being the combustion chamber for earthly change. In other words, out of your heart flow the issues of life. So it's highly unlikely that your heart, the combustion chamber, chamber of earthly change, will ever move into compassion towards anyone that you despise. How can you be mixed with love and sympathy or compassion in some kind of way when you despise or you look down on somebody? Scripture teaches the Christian that even your enemy, the one who's hostile towards you, the one who is hateful to you, the one who is in your way, they're your opposition, that you're to love them with compassion and to pray for them. But the real question is, do you see the church doing that? And I'm not saying that as a, a derogatory or a put down to any specific church. I'm talking about the global church of Jesus. But you can bring it down into a community and say, do you really see that in the community life that we live? So I believe that it's the call of heaven that every one of us is to learn to live generously. But in order to do that, you've got to deny yourself. Amen. Let's look at the next point, Cammy. Learn to live generously and share what you have. And what you're supposed to have as believers is moral character. The character of Christ. Don't close your heart. If you close your heart to anyone around you, there's no way for you to become compassionate or to move in compassion. You say, Pastor, why is that significant? Because I believe, and I'm, this is Dwayne speaking, I, I believe that there's no real prayer movement in the church today because we're really not compassionate towards others. We really don't have a heart for the broken, the lost. We don't have a heart. Now listen to me. I, I'm not talking about whitewashing everything that's going on in our nation because there's some things that we need to speak truth to. But remember, our warfare is not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and the powers of the darkness. We have to remember that our warfare is coming from an influence of a second heaven. Satan is contaminating the hearts and the minds of people. And the word of God tells us before you came to Christ, you were contaminated. So let's look at Proverbs chapter 3, verse 29. Everybody still okay? You say, Pastor, how long are we going to We're going to keep talking about this. I don't know. I'm just saying that. It's not stopping out there, so why should it stop in here? Amen. Right. Right. Now you, talk. you know, in the American Revolution, historians now write that the greatest force in the American Revolution was the Black Robe Brigade. And the Black Robe Brigade were the ministers of the gospel who stood up on Sunday morning and they taught from the word of God why America was being separated to become America. And there were ministers who 
encouraged all the men in their church to arm up. And at times, the whole group of ministers and men in the church would leave church and go fight in the American Revolution and come back and worship again. In American history proves that the church was very influential in the victory that was at hand. Yeah. Do you think it's going to be any different today? Yeah. We saw a video not long ago, and I think you probably can still find it on our website, of a, a miracle that happened between a slave, a slave family and a slave owner's family that happened hundreds of years later where the two of them got together, never knowing that they came off of the same family line. They were both named the same names, same genealogy, except one was a slave tribe, one was the owners, and not knowing, but God put them back together, and now they're part of this massive prayer uh, move of, uh, in America, and it's all because of the fact that now there's compassion for one another. And one of the guys, Elman, correct me if I'm wrong, but how did he actually say it? You can never have a united, a united America without having a united church? A united church to heal the divided America. It will take a united church to heal a divided America. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. So let's look at this. Why would you hold a grudge in your heart. Now I'm reading this out of the Passion Translation because I think that this is very fitting for what we're talking about today. Why would you hold a grudge in your heart toward your neighbor who lives next to you? Question mark. Why do you do this? And why would you quarrel with those who have done nothing to wrong you? Question mark. You see all these are about the heart. It's about the heart. And this question that comes up that I made real big is that a chip on your shoulder, question mark? In other words, what's your problem? Why do you act that way? Why are you such a cynic? Why are you so mean-spirited? Why are you so divisive? Now, God wasn't talking to the world right here. He was talking to his own people. Amen. Preach on, Pastor. This is a great word. You really like striking my heart. It doesn't feel good. And he says, like, don't act like bullies or learn their ways. Every violent thug is despised by the Lord. But here's the point. Now listen. Every tender lover finds friendship with God. And here's the key point. And will hear his intimate secrets. Now, why is that important? Because earthly change comes from the third heaven. And you can never hear from God if you're divisive or uh, divisive. My wife corrects me on my English all the time. One time I said, the CDC does not want you close to me because of my spittle. She goes, what is spittle? I says, when I spit. <laughs> So, I have my own dictionary. I think I read spittle in the Word of God. I got it from the Bible. Yeah, so I always call it covert. And Rachel says, COVID. I said, they all understand. <laughs> now, Rachel says, I'm changing this on purpose. We're going to call it co-rid. We're going to rid it. Get rid of it. Co-rid. Get out of here. So here's the deal. Hatred keeps old quarrels alive, but love finds a way to make sin disappear. Oh, praise God. You see, this is why compassion is so important. Because the love at some point is going to say, hey, look, yesterday's yesterday. Today's a brand new day. I'm better with you than without you. Come on, let's move on together. Matthew chapter 5, verse 47 and 48. So Jesus says this, If you salute your brother only, what do you do more than others? In other words, you're supposed to do more. The believer's supposed to do more. Because you know why? More is expected of God. Why is not God come and redeem us and heal us and, and just transform everything over? Because we don't do more. 
We just greet those that we love and we don't try to bridge gaps and we don't try to make friends. We're just stuck in our little world. But he says, but the people that you despise called the publicans, they do that. They act just like that. The sinners that you say, them sinners right there, that's all they do right there. They just do like that. And Jesus says, but if you act like that, then you're just like them. Now I put on that accent and I was looking at my South Lafouche folks and I was not doing that in any form of, uh, that was just Dwayne being Dwayne. I was really looking at Elman and Tina because they're, they're down the by all the time. All right, so he says, be, for, be therefore perfect. Be mature, complete. Be whole. Even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. So even as your Father is perfect, I want you to reflect Him in the earth by being perfect. Be generous. Demonstrate it. So reveal your identity as God's children. Lose the chip on your shoulder and be kind. Be perfect as your Father which is in heaven because your actions manifest heaven on the earth. Your actions are super, super important. So let's go back to kind of like our main topic right here. Learn to live generously. Share what you have. Don't close your heart. Because Jesus teaches from the language of the heart. So if Jesus teaches from the language of the heart and you got your heart closed to people groups or... Then we just leave it at people's group. Then how will you ever be an effective minister of the gospel? But if we're going to demonstrate generosity, we have to do it with pure motives. Yeah. And pure motives just means my, my motives can't be mixed. There can't be another substance in me. My, my motives have to, has to be kingdom oriented. Don't limit, don't just listen. Don't limit your kindness. Don't limit Jesus. Amen. Listen, I don't know what happens in everybody's life. I don't know the pain, the bruises, the disappointments, the frustrations, the things that you've had to go through in your life. I don't, I don't know those things. Neither do you know mine. But I've come to this place in my life. What I went through has made me who I am today. And I hold no bitterness. And I'm not angry. I just want to be like Jesus. And everybody has a story. Everybody has a failure. Everybody's been corrupted by the system of the world. Nobody sits here innocent without Jesus. So the whole point here is, if your spirit burns with light, then you will be a shining lamp. Amen. But you've got to allow your spirit to burn so we've been given a directive by the kingdom of God. Examine your hearts. Examine the words that you speak, the actions that you reveal. Because your words and your actions really do reveal your heart. And every one of us should be getting better and better and better and better. It doesn't mean that you don't get frustrated. It doesn't mean that you don't get upset. It doesn't mean that people don't kind of like tick you off at times. But the progression of the kingdom of God is that he's changing me. He's working on my heart. Bringing me somewhere that I'm not. So when I say examine your motives, what do I really mean? Examine what ignites or incites your actions. What determines the choices that you make? And what moves you are the will of your life. What, what things are the motive of your, of your life? And I do want to make this point. For those of us who love Jesus, the kingdom of God should be the motive. His outcome. Now here's something that I mentioned last week that I think is valuable enough to bring up again. It's something that every one of us should take an account of, of demonstrating generosity. But I want to show you Luke chapter 18, verses 11 through 14. 
The Bible says that the Pharisee, which is noted as a religious or um, a God-loving leader of that day, even though now we look at the Pharisee as being somebody who opposed Jesus in that day before Jesus, they were known as the representation of God in the earth. So the Pharisee, he stood and he prayed, and, and he prayed thus with himself. It doesn't even, because of his attitude. His attitude wasn't right, so the Bible doesn't even say that he prayed to God. He was praying with himself. Maybe that's why more things don't get done. Yeah. <laughs> because we're self-centered. <laughs> oh, we'll move right on. And this is what he said. God, I thank thee that I'm not like other men are. I'm not an extortioner, unjust, an adulterer. I'm not even like this dude over here. A publican. Now that dude that was right there that he was like looking down on was his neighbor. That dude right there was a fellow worshiper in the house of God. That dude was in the house of God but detested. Then he goes on to make sure that God knows how great he is. For I fast twice a week. I want you to notice all the eyes. I give tithes of all that I possess. But the publican, the guy who was detested by the religious leader, standing afar off, wouldn't even so much as lift his eyes to heaven, but he smote his breast and he's saying, God, be merciful to me. I'm a sinner. How many of you can see right here, he cried to the Lord in his time of trouble. Yep. And Jesus turns and he says to his followers, I tell you, this man, the one who was detested, he went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone that exalts himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. See, it's, the, it's, it's you and I who are willing to deny ourselves to chase after the plan of God. You know, I don't want this time in American history to go back to normal. I want it to be a new day of outbreak. Amen. Yeah. Amen. I want it to be, I don't know about you, I want it to be a day where um, those who all come together in the common good of the faith of Jesus Christ can get together without being threatened by one another and to celebrate our differences yet our similarities and to call out to God commonly for a move of heaven that will straighten all of this stuff up. Great. See, Pastor, do you really believe that that is possible? I do. Absolutely. Let me show you this. In Psalms chapter 107, verses 4 through 6, talking about Israel, and the word says, They wandered in the wilderness in a solitary way. They found no city to dwell in. Hungry and thirsty, their soul fainted in them. And they cried unto the Lord in their trouble. And he delivered them out of all their distresses. Now Israel represents the church. And the church is in a place, I believe, that's wandering with no direction. It finds no dwelling place. Doesn't know how to get along with each other. So it's in a solitary, single way. And the church, in some cases, in a lot of cases, is desperate and filled with despair. And the reason for it is because there's no city for them to dwell in. So they're hungry and thirsty. They're looking for unity. They just haven't found it. So their soul faints within them. Their inside world is weak and feeble, imperfect. But when the church cries unto the Lord, but when the church cries unto the Lord, not as the Pharisee spoke before the Lord, but when the church cries out to the Lord, help us! which is a plural statement. Help us. Rescue us in our troubled times. The word says, God delivered them. Hallelujah. So you've got to put on compassion. You've got to be willing to demonstrate generosity. When you do these things, God does his best work. I read this to you previously, but I would like to read it to you once again. Jesus always does his best where Satan does his worst. 
He always does his best where the devil tries to do his best. And what the devil does is he tries to divide and conquer all the time. But I want to remind you of who you are. You are the redeemed of the Lord. Jesus came as the head of the church and he smashed every prison door. He shattered every steel bar that kept us bound up. He came to set us free. And so today we become now the redeemed. And we're here to smash every heavy prison door. We're here to shatter every steel bar and to set the captive free. Why? Because together we either rise together or we fall together. So I don't know about you, but I think we're living in a day where it's time to be delivered from our distress. To be delivered from our pain, the anguish of our body, our soul. I'm tired of being oppressed with calamity. And I'm tired of being miserable. And all this stuff in the, in the, in has surfaced that in the last three months, think about how your world has changed. Being forced to stay at home, forced to wear a mask, forced to not use cash. You didn't, have you, any of you went to Lowe's lately? This is the place I've been the most because I've been doing a lot of uh, improvements around my place. And there's a sign that says, cards only, cash limited. I'm like, what is this? Mm. All right. Be wise. Amen. Be smart. And be like Jesus. Let's stand up.